so that the white culture would feel comfortable with these products of black culture. It is also something that in the, in the Harlem Renaissance happened a little bit with uh, white people going to uh, 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 clubs where Duke Ellington would play. Duke Ellington would look marvelous in his tuxedo and, and his whole uh, band would too, but it was still completely segregated. So here, after, segre after desegregation, there was a, a conscious attempt at the, at the black, uh, at the side of the, the, the black uh, cultural producers to make something that would cover the entire market, white and black. So uh, the music was still black, but it was in, in a kind of shell that did not uh, scare away uh, the whites. Now one of the most interesting I uh, ideas of uh, Barry Gordy was, he of course had also worked in a car factory. And his idea for man organizing musical production the way that he did uh, was uh, by... Um, came from the assembly line. He said that I want to create a company that a black kid with a little bit of talent walks in one door and then he comes out of the other door as a world famous pop star who knows how to dance, who knows how to uh, hold his knife and fork, who knows how to sing, who writes songs, who has a whole team around him of songwriters and producers and musicians and uh, etc. So it's an idea of the pop star the, the, uh, the, we, as, uh, as a product on the assembly line. And one of the, the groups that made that most literal was Martha and the Vandellas. Martha and the Vandellas, you should all l look up this song, uh, it's Dancing in the Streets. When the clip, one of the first video clips of Dancing in the Streets was made, they filmed it on the assembly line in one of the Ford factories. So you had these three girls sitting there mouthing this fantastic song, dancing in the streets on the assembly line with black and white guys uh, doing things to the car that they were sitting on. This car gradually coming together while they were singing their song. But dancing in the street was a huge hit in the, exactly at the point that uh, the riots broke out. So Dallas, who is now a councilwoman in Detroit, and she says that while they were, s they were on stage in one of the theaters, the riots actually broke out. And the interesting thing of dancing in the streets was that it became more or less the unofficial anthem of the rioters. So the rioters said, we're just dancing in the streets. And they were singing dancing in the streets all the time. They were putting on dancing in the streets while they were uh, looting and, and uh, uh, looting shops and, and, uh, and uh, fighting the police, uh, etc. So dancing in the streets all of a sudden became something else. And all of a sudden this black music took on a completely different meaning. And uh, one of the, the people where you can see, so black musicians also Remember that uh, uh, in the beginning that I said that the black protesters did not want to listen to these people of the NAACP who said, calm down now. They said, we don't want to calm down. We don't want to talk anymore. We don't want to play good, be nice anymore. Because the, the way that this city is being run is so hostile to us, is so, uh, so racist, is so in s deeply, deeply, deeply unfair to us. We are, all, we are completely the victim of this. Nothing that is happening here is good for us. Why should we behave? Why should we? Martha Reeves, if you, look, if you listen to that uh, uh, interview, she's now, uh, she's a woman in her early 60s, councilwoman in the, in the council of the municipality of Detroit, a big, big, big uh, icon of uh, soul music, she now, even if she's a completely responsible councilwoman, says that it was good, these riots. It needed to happen because the tension and the frustration was so big, it needed to explode. So she said, and it was good that it, okay, it, it, uh, it destroyed some things, but it was good, it needed to happen. It, it was like a carnival, she says, it exploded. But, you know, like a carnival, you, you just forget all rules and just uh, be yourself. 
so dancing in the streets became the kind of anthem of, of these riots and it was still seen, still now, by a completely responsible, sensible woman and you, you can hear this everywhere uh, as something that needed to happen. So this needed to happen. This was the dancing in the streets. Another person, one of the biggest stars of Motown, Marvin Gaye, here looking uh, in a suit that could be worn by Don Draper, if you know who I'm talking about. Uh, the, uh, the most elegant, the best dressed, the most suave and cool uh, soul singer of all. He looked as if he would never even be able to sweat. But he had this beautiful voice and he sang songs like uh, I, I Heard It on the Grapevine before 1967. After the riots, of course the riots were not the only thing. There was also the murder of a, a Martin Luther King in 68. But after this period you can see that black music took on this completely different meaning. Instead of entertainers, uh, they became much more autonomous protesters, much more protesting their difference with other people than their sameness, much more uh, angry, much more sad, much more militant, but also much more sexy, much more physical, much more uh, adventurous and wild. So this is, this is this switch from the cool entertainer, a kind of slightly darker version of, of a Nat King Cole or even of uh, Frank Sinatra, turn into this angry and, uh, and uh, of course the, the whole black, black fashion became instead of trying to be like white fashion, it became something in itself. So you have the, the, the kind of what was later called the, the, the pimp look, these enormous uh, uh, leather, uh, uh, leather coats. And this, is, this album actually, What's Going On, is also his m most important album. With, and it's basically a kind of sociological uh, analysis of what is going on in the United States, in the, in the inner cities, with the racism and the war, etc. And the most famous song of this was then also called Inner City Blues. You know, I mean, I don't have to read, you, you, you should just all inform yourselves of this, those who have, don't know it already. But also, black culture then started to nearly celebrate this kind of dirty, dangerous, uh, poor, but extremely authentic background that they came from. Uh, in the 90s even, and th there was a kind of nostalgia uh, clay animation show created by Eddie Murphy called the PJs. And the PJs is another word for the projects. And uh, uh, these, this uh, clay animation series played in Detroit in the Brewster Douglas homes, the ones that you've seen a couple of times before where the Supremes come from. And uh, here, here you have them. This is the leader of this. You can all get this on YouTube. It's really funny. Um, uh, the P it's, it's a kind of very satirical uh, presentation of this kind of working class black culture inside these projects. And, it's with the, and it celebrates the kind of s the, 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 the habits, the strange accents, the, the food, uh, the total chaos all the time, the density within these areas as the real producer more or less of an authentically American black culture on the uh, language, clothes, food, music, film, art, etc. Here you see two of the kids trying to uh, change the or uh, turn uh, to uh, change the lamp in the stairwell of the project. So there, there were two sides to this. However, there was this kind of celebratory uh, uh, side, and then there was the the protest singer side by, uh, there are th actually more sides, of course, by, by Marvin Gaye. And then there is also this thing of dancing in the streets. That dancing in the streets could mean getting yourself a machine gun and shooting at the police. Could also be dancing in the streets. And so what you had also in the, middle si in the late 60s is the rise of the Black Panther Party. A militant, armed, it's nearly like they said, 
we do not want integration anymore. Forget it. Uh, Martin Luther King, uh, for all his efforts of integration, achieving equal rights, working with the whites, etc., uh, forget it. That doesn't work. He gets shot. And uh, the, the, the federal army gets sent to Detroit to, uh, uh, to put down, uh, to, uh, to fight the black Americans as if they were Vietnamese communists. So we are not part of America. We are, n we are not part of, of you. We do not answer to your laws. We are not part of your culture, of your country. We do not answer to, uh, to your police. We are our own nation. And so th this was the Black Panther Party. And the Black Panther Party said, uh, we have to arm ourselves, we have to inform ourselves, and we have to, we have to protect our people against the, against the um, violence of the whites. So here, here you have them marching through the streets. Actually, if you look at uh, Public Enemy, the rap group from New York in the late 80s, they are also still more or less part of the Black Panther. The Black Panther movement also had ministers, professors, their own universities, etc. Power to the people then and now is what they... Uh, so it's a kind of strange mixture of black nationalism, Afrocentrism, Marxism, anarchism, uh, uh, etc. And this is their fant fantastically beautiful uh, logo. Now, in, um, there was also another thing going on. The white lower middle classes living in and around uh, Detroit also reacted in an interesting way to, of course, you have to imagine this is the late 60s, May 68 in Paris, the enormous protests against the Vietnam War on American campuses. There was not just a, a war going on between black and white, there was also a war going on between a certain type, of course, of youths, of students, of young people, white or black, but often white, uh, and the authorities. There was also a generation war going on. And in Detroit, this kind of what in the rest, in other places, could be something like Woodstock or Jesus Christ Superstar or something wonderful and peaceful and, and uh, hippie like that. This kind of uh, youth war plus the violence in Detroit created something uh, specific. This is the group called the Motor City Five, the MC5, one of the very first punk groups uh, that ever existed. And they uh, wanted to play, they with started the White Panther movement. Not because they, out of a white supremacist uh, idea, it was because an interview with one of the uh, Black Panthers, they said, how can the young white people help you and s support you in your struggle against white power? And then Huey Newton, the leader of the Black Panther, said, well, they should start a White Panther Party. And that is exactly what the MC5 did. And the MC5 was a punk group led by a Marxist ideologue who wanted to create a political movement and they wanted to play music so loud and so harsh and so ugly that it would represent the real violence and the real struggle and the real wildness of, uh, of their times. And this also came out, here you can see their mo one of their most famous songs, Motor City is Burning. Motor City being, of course, uh, Detroit. Their idea of the D riots in Detroit of the burning Motor City was that this was the best thing that could ever happen. Why? Because they said this entire culture is being destroyed and out of it something new will come. So they were ready to not just protest or not just give off a sign so that things could be better it was, a, it was a, a, of course, drugs did play a role in, in these uh, <laughs> political uh, uh, analyses, but um, they were ready for the total destruction of culture as they knew it right, there, right then, right now. Uh, 